Let's talk about Epicureanism and philosophy after Aristotle. So first of all, Epicureanism is not going to be exactly what you expect, especially if you're familiar with the word Epicurean. That's unfortunate. It has a connotation that isn't really true to what was going on originally with Epicurus and his school in the garden. So an Epicurean now is somebody who appreciates fine things, you know, a gourmand or something. Ah, that's not Epicurus at all. I don't think he would have recognized himself in that. The only shred of truth in that is that it's related at least to something we would recognize as a hedonistic pleasure. But at the same time, Epicurus was reacting against hedonism, but especially reacting against Platonism and the schools of the time, the Academy and the Lyceum. So, for Plato and Aristotle, we had these megalithic philosophical systems that had, you know, internal coherence and lots of moving parts and lots of complexity and things going on, required dedicated study and many years, etc., etc. Epicurus and a lot of the philosophy that we get after Aristotle was decidedly more grounded and practical. It was more concerned with the no kidding here and now, how do we actually live a good life? not just for the arist aristocratic philosophers and the aristocratic people who could afford to actually go to the schools, but for your average person. What's something that they can really use? Now, why this happened is kind of an interesting question. Because, I mean, obviously you had a certain amount of momentum with Plato and Aristotle. Philosophy was headed in a certain direction. One of the possibilities in terms of this change of direction, especially a reactionary change in direction, is that it was partially motivated by a decay in terms of Hellenistic religiosity. And so if religion itself is not serving as much of the needs of the people, then the people need to go somewhere. And if they can't go to Plato and Aristotle, because a lot of people just simply can't understand it, which would be, you know, kind of understandable. Um, it's not easy. You know, it's not for everyone. Not everybody is cut out to be a Socrates, so to speak. But at the same time, you still have to live. You still have to figure things out. And so what do you do? And so Epicurus regarded himself as self-taught. And so this is unusual. This is already a kind of separation. And he bought a piece of property called the garden. And so his school was in the garden. And the Epicureans are known for their association with this. And Epicurus was decidedly very practical in his focus and in his approach to seeing the world, understanding things, the senses were something that we could trust. And so materialism, understanding what we got from, okay, you know, the world is giving us truth, what do we do with it? Okay, you know, in other words, I'm not going to invest in, speaking as Epicurus, something like the, you know, eternal realm of the forms, which is unseen, but higher than everything in reality, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, with Platonism. Instead, here, here's what we have. Life is what we have coming in right now with my eyes and my ears and my senses. What do I do with it? And so his response was kind of interestingly and in a very modern sort of way, really, enjoy your friends, you know? Trust what it is that the world gives you. Find a good way of living that is peaceful. Don't make life overly complicated. Yeah, obviously, avoid pain and we'll figure out, okay, how should we avoid pain? What is the appropriate thing to do in terms of practically living right here and right now to avoid pain? So, avoiding complexity. Well, okay, so let's not bother with politics. That's just, you know, uh, that's not great. It produces a lot of stress. It's also pursuing things like wealth and fame, which he recognized as being, you know, vain and empty. So, in terms of his categorization of what the desires were. He had a tripartite characterization. So you had three different categories. You had the things that were necessary. So they were good and necessary. They were things that I had to do. And then you had things that, you know, they were natural, but they weren't really necessary. So stuff that I want naturally, but I don't really need. So I have stuff that I need. I have stuff that I want. <laughs> And then I have these vain pursuits of fame and glory and politics and all of these sorts of things, and I don't really need those, and so let's just do away with it. And so in other words, Epicureanism, instead of being about the fine things, the way that we use the word now, was about simplicity, was about living simply, living very frugally, maybe even ascetically. And so Epicurus was big on friendship, <laughs> He was big on living very simply, whatever it is that you can do that will make it possible for you to get by and be happy. So meeting the needs, getting what's necessary, not necessarily getting all that you want, including, by the way, sex. And so while he 
didn't have good things to say about marriage. That was, again, a complexity kind of like politics. Even with sex, it's like, okay, yeah, natural, but in many cases not really necessary, and so he was going to generally abstain from that. Not exactly the sort of thing that we think of with the hedonists, and not exactly the sort of thing that we think of when we think about Epicureans now. So I think this is a little bit different to what it is that we're accustomed to. So what does he actually prescribe? So the key word for the Epicureans and the final state was ataraxia. And so ataraxia is tranquility. It is peace. It is a serenity that comes with simplicity, where your needs are met and your wants are few. And that's key because both of those have to be the case, where, okay, get the things that you need. Got it. Check. Everybody can kind of understand that. But when it comes to limiting your wants, think about that for a minute. How do you limit your wants? I mean, if I go buy a bakery that has just baked bread or has baked cookies, do I control wanting a cookie or wanting bread? That's not as easy, right? Training your desires, is that something that we can do? Can we actually train to attenuate or limit or eliminate desires? It's not obvious. And in fact, this is frequently the objection that people have, especially to, I mean, philosophy after Aristotle, but even with Aristotle. The question of training your desires and trying to become more virtuous as a human being, that's not the sort of thing that we often think is necessarily possible. And so it behooves us to think in a little bit more detail about this, psychologically, what can we actually do as humans? Is it possible for us to train our desires, to train them away, or to train some sort of attenuation of them? Can we attenuate habit over time? Well, now all of a sudden, okay, yeah, kind of, right? I mean, the habits are hard, but it's tractable. We can do it. And so you have to kind of work at it for maybe like three weeks consistently, and then you can start to do it. I mean, so we're not as unfamiliar with that. Everybody knows what it's like to get a bad habit, how awful it is, but how possible it is to actually do something about it. The question is, are desires themselves in part informed by habit? What is the impact of habit on thought? Not just physical things, but habits of thought and emotion and desire. Is that something that we can actually train? The Greeks thought so, Aristotle thought so, Epicurus thought so. And so there's a long tradition of saying that, okay, yeah, you know, you walk by a, um, a bakery and they have chocolate chip cookies that have just come out of the oven. There's going to be a certain amount of pleasure and a certain amount of reaction and motion in the mind that comes ineluctably, that there's not much you can do about it. But there's a lot more that you can do about what happens immediately following that instant than you might realize. And that's the idea. I think that's what Aristotle and that's what Epicurus would also tell us about this. One of the other ideas that we should mention from Epicurus is the idea of the swerve and his atomism. So he's famous for this, and largely famous due to what it is that you can read in Lucretius, De Rerum Natura, with the clinomen, the swerve. And so if you've heard of that, that idea, it's likely that you've heard of it through Lucretius. Now, what is the swerve and what is going on with atomism? So Epicurus was not the first to be an atomist. He followed Democritus in this way. Democritus was famous for atomism, for saying that you have this world of material stuff, and at its base, you have atoms. Now, an atom, the Greek word for atom, A plus tomos, means uncuttable. So an atom is something that cannot be divided further. It is the base thing. So we can't continue to divide things. We've reached rock bottom. This is the uncuttable substance at the base of reality. That's what's meant by the word atom. And I think this carries over quite naturally into the way that we're accustomed to thinking about it, at least when we learn the Bohr model of the atom, which is now over a century old, right? So at the same time, when you hear somebody say, oh, no, there are quarks inside of the atom, well, all of a sudden we've departed from, you know, what's going on with the, the ancient Greeks. But for Democritus, you had atoms. They were undividable. They were not capable of being split further. And 
Epicurus follows him on this. Now, the swerve, Epicurus tells us that all these atoms, all of matter, is naturally going down. It's naturally moving in a particular direction, and to be able to get collisions, we have to have some kind of movement from there. Like, so it's like, you know, parallel lines that are always going to be moving, and they can do so into infinity without ever hitting one another. But if there's any kind of divergence at all, and with parallel lines, there doesn't have to be much of a divergence, right? This tiny little swerve in a parallel line eventually it's going to cross. It's going to intersect, it will collide with the other parallel line, and then once that collision happens once, it sets off a chain reaction so that you have collisions all over the place. And so what Epicurus tells us is that we have these swerves that what is otherwise deterministic behavior, sometimes randomly and for reasons that he doesn't give us, doesn't go into, may not have known, maybe it was just an intuition, who knows, you have a swerve. And the swerve gives us kind of this beginning of the possibility of all things existing. And so it has a kind of cosmogonic quality to it in terms of the origins of life itself, of matter, of the world as we know it, all things being possible because the swerve enables collisions, whereas otherwise there would be no interaction between things. So that's a curious idea, but one that you're likely to have heard of and one that you should know and associate with Epicurus.